Hey guys, welcome to me reacting to now. I am going to watch this and react to it because I want to. Anyways, let's get right into it. Hi, I'm Masahiro Sakura. What? Today I'd like to introduce you to the new Super Smash Brothers game for the Nintendo Switch. Many what? players have appeared in the series. I'm sure you're all eager to find out who will be joining the roster this time. What? Please take a look. Snake. Snake. What? Oh, is that is that meme where he puts random characters? Yep. Wow. Good job. I mean, I I I, I kind of expected that. So, filthy Frank, Nugget, Robbie Rotten, number one. Wow. That okay. That's good. That's good. I I thought I was just expecting the animatron. What? Oh, oh, we're back to the old intro now. We're at the intro now. Hello, Internet. I love Welcome this. To game theory. I love this channel. The William Afton of YouTube. I always come back. So here's something crazy. Wow. You know, every FNAF game tends to have five main nights, a bonus sixth night that gets you more lore hints, and then a challenge mode seventh night where you customize all the animatronics. Well, look at the games. We have five main games bearing the five nights title, a bonus sixth game that was mostly for lore, and now a seventh standalone release where you customize the animatronics. Yeah. The game releases directly mirror the gameplay. Either Scott is a mad genius or I'm thinking about things way oh. too hard. You try to read into everything. Every little thing and find meaning in everything anyone says. <laughs> or just drive yourself crazy. I heard you last time, Mr. Hippo. But guess what, you Barney reject? <laughs> Every little thing is the only way to have this oh. series make any sort of sense whatsoever. Case in point, today's episode. With the final novel out and ultimate cut should be a little bit long. Shreds, it finally feels like the story of FNAF is at its end. Or at least the Afton storyline is at its end. The series yeah. will probably come back to tell another story in the same universe later. I mean, now five exactly nights nine. Find it. FNAF 4, the quote unquote final chapter. Yeah. Dot, dot, dot of the original FNAF story. I see what you did there, Scotty. It's the final chapter of the original story. But oh no, friends, he wasn't done. He even ended that no. teaser with a question mark and you brightened that screen up enough. Oh, really? Yeah, Scott, you really wanted to leave the door open for more games in the series. Oh. Didn't you? you were milking it more than I was. Or I guess we're both milkmaids at the teat of Freddy Fazcow. Anyways, they what? say FNAF World, the pieces are in place for us. So it's time to take one final step back and put every single one of those pieces together into this my final timeline for the final FNAF game oh. you know, uh, let me save you some work if you brighten the image you see on screen right now you'll see that there's a question mark there since you know I always come back wow and if he comes back well I gotta pull myself a Samurai Freddy and pursue the anime Fox of Truth yeah. wherever it may lead let's do this now putting together a final timeline of events for this series is incredibly challenging and requires us covering a lot of really minute details from literally every element the series which is why this video is over 25 minutes has ever released this is my longest most involved theory in seven years covering every square inch of the series wow so fair warning that this episode is not for the faint of heart it is extreme a way for me to simultaneously flex my knowledge of the minutiae of the series all while trying to come up with a satisfactory answer to pretty much every question it has ever thrown our way and of course there wow. are some questions that don't have clean answers which I'll be calling out for you as I go. So for those of you who want to take the challenge and attempt a timeline on your own, let me first explain my thought process. As I was writing this episode, there are three hard and fast rules that All I right. applied. First, it's important to note that I put greater emphasis on information that was released more recently in the series. While, yes, everything in the series is important, by FNAF 4 and even more so sister location, we can assume that Scott had a complete picture of the story in his mind. It's easy to forget oh, yeah. that FNAF 1 was going to be Scott's final game after a year of trying to be a game designer and hitting dead ends. Do you really think that he imagined a lore so deep that it would cover eight games, five books, and countless teasers? That he predicted his story would be so massively popular that it would involve undead purple people way back when we were all just making memes about Foxy, Swiggity, Swooty coming for that booty? Probably not. So wow. That the newest information we're getting in the games is the most accurate in pointing to the final story he's looking to tell. So that's rule number one. Rule 
Goal number two, adhering to key dates and events. Ooh. Now, there isn't much that's certain in this story, which means that the things we do oh. know must serve as fixed points that the other details fit around. We know for a fact from FNAF 1 phone calls that the animatronics are allowed to walk around freely until the bite of 87. We know from FNAF 3 calls that the golden springlock suits are eventually retired to a back room after a tragedy at a sister location, oh. FNAF 4 Bite, which itself takes place in 1983. FNAF 3 also tells us that at some point, William Afton tries to dismantle the robots, whose spirits rebel, causing him to become Springtrap, eventually getting himself sealed up behind a wall until the workers at Fazbear Fright discover his body and set him loose again. Details like those have to be our guideposts if we're having any hopes oh. of getting anywhere in the story. And lastly, rule number three, realizing that this isn't just a simple linear timeline. It's clearly oh. established in the games that multiple Fazbear locations exist at the same time, and that the events in one affect what happens in other locations. For proof, just look at Phone Guy in FNAF 3. Uh, welcome to your new career as a performer slash entertainer for Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Right now, we have two specially designed suits that double as both animatronic and suit. After learning of an unfortunate incident at the sister location involving multiple Don't jump scare us, please. spring lock failures, the company has deemed the suit temporarily unfit for employees. This not only tells us that the first Freddy Fazbear's Pizza had two golden suits, but also that the first Freddy's was open at the same time as the FNAF 4 Freddy's. The spring lock failure in the FNAF 4 location prompted the yellow suits to be retired in the FNAF 1 location. In short, a lot of these events overlap. Restaurants often stay open for years beyond what we see in the games, and everything weaves together in a way that's much more complicated than simply saying, this restaurant opened, kids died, it closed. The next one opened, kids died again, it closed. In all honesty, I suppose you could simplify it to that level, but we're not going to. I am holding myself oh. to a higher standard. A slightly higher standard, but a higher standard nonetheless. So with those three logical rules in place, let's get analyzing. To begin, we have to identify who William's first victim was. Now, I've covered FNAF a lot, but in all my theories, one thing has remained consistent since FNAF 2, that the puppet was first, Henry's daughter. She is the character who gives life to all the other animatronics, so yeah. it just makes sense for her to be victim numero uno. But outside of that, it's always been just an assumption. And now that we've seen the event actually take place in the games, I think I've been wrong about it this entire time. What? Think about it. We have proof that William kills Henry's daughter in FNAF 6, but as I talked about in a previous theory, we see that later that night, Afton goes to a place called Junior's where he's turned away at the door. Now, why would Scott show us this? FNAF 6 was all about tying up loose ends. He's not just gonna throw in a random bar to establish that the mustard man is an alcoholic or anything. He's doing it to establish a timeline. The only time we hear of anyone being turned away from any building for any reason in this series is in FNAF 2. From what I understand, the building is on lockdown. No one is allowed in or out, you know, especially concerning any oh. previous employees. And the name Juniors makes sense in <gasps> Scott's classic way of giving us clues that are meant to clarify things Toys. but really just end up confusing all of us. Remember, FNAF 2's location is the grand reopening, a second Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria location. A junior location, if you will. And lastly, to no further way. solidify the puppet coming later in the timeline, remember why Freddy's closed in the first place. It wasn't due to murders or animatronics going haywire. According to the FNAF 1 newspapers, people just got weirded out by a place where kids disappeared. Quote, after a long struggle to stay in business after the tragedy that took place there many years ago, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza has announced that it'll close by year's end. Oh! This all means that the missing children's incident where five kids go missing at a Freddy Fazbear's Pizza must be the first event of the timeline. William Afton uses the spring bonnie suit to lure five kids to the back in employees only safe rooms that we hear about in FNAF 3, oh. hiding their dead bodies in the animatronic suits. We can oh, that's even terrifying. Hear of who was killed when based on clues in an ultimate custom night. We know with 100% certainty that Chica was first based on one of her death lines. I was the first. I have seen everything. Well, I mean, she just told you. That's about as explicit as you get with these games. From a storytelling standpoint, I hate that Chica's first because it really should have been Golden Freddy so he could be the first spirit killed and the final spirit to haunt Afton in Custom Night, but whatever. Chica, aka Susie, is death number one. She's lured away by Afton, telling her that her dog died. We see it in FNAF 6's Fruity Maze. We also read about it in the fourth closet. Really? Well, beside them was a little girl with blonde curls. I heard Daddy say he was hit by a car, but I knew it wasn't true. Bonnie told me it wasn't true. He said he found my puppy. And did he take you to your puppy? He took me, but I don't remember. My 
name's Susie. We even hear about it in the Chica anime cutscenes from Custom Nights. I told him that someone ran over his dog in front of my house. No hey, way. Scott, I know we were all looking for answers. No but way. Man, you beat that one over the head, didn't you? Not that I'm complaining, but that one was a bit overly obvious, and then all the other ones are just so damn obscure. Just gotta find a better balance here, man. From there, we know that four other kids get taken and stuffed into suits. We know their names based on the gravestones at the end of FNAF 6. Gabriel, Fritz, Jeremy, and... Grass. Hey, who are we to judge what other people name their kids? Probably some celebrity's kid. Oh, you must be my children. This is Apple. Audio science. And the grass. All joking aside, the loyal theorists will remember this last parade was giving me a lot of... Oh, yeah. Past theory. You see, this book, the FNAF Survival Logbook, holds a ton of reveals about the franchise, but they're all in the code. Some I was able to deduce. Some left me stumped. But a few hours after releasing my video covering the book, the mystery was solved by the brilliant deduction of game theorist subreddit user DPowerful1. DPowerful1 used the numbers that I had found, 52, 39, 15, 17, oh. 10, 11, 8, 11, and put them not into an alphabet grid for ciphers like I'd been doing and like the book was clearly hinting towards, but instead put them into the word search of all places. Oh! The numbers as coordinates in the word search Yo. It's me. No way. Which lines up with the fifth mystery gravestone at the end of FNAF 6 and a mention of Cassidy in the final FNAF novel, The Fourth Closet. And that would be more than enough proof, but it's not all. In the novel, Cassidy is described as a girl with black hair. And what do we see in the log? The puppet giving cake to a little girl with black hair. Yo! Human child with red tallies. No less. And it's happening on a page talking about your happiest day. A direct reference to the happiest day minigame from Yo. the story where the puppet gives cake to Golden Freddy in an effort to release its soul. You can even hear a girlish laugh every time Golden Freddy is summoned way back in oh, yeah. one. Yeah, we know that. Everything about this reveal lines up. Everything, of course, no except way. for the pronoun of he being used to talk about the one you should not have killed throughout Custom Night, which, as we established last episode, is referring to Golden Freddy. But consider this. Golden Freddy is a male character. He's Freddy Fazbear. He's Fredbear. Regardless of the spirit that possesses it. So the gender confusion works here. Scott even used oh, really? to manage the casting call, where he was specifically looking for auditions where, quote, the gender should not be immediately clear. It should work as either a young boy or a young girl. Now, teaching kids that gender is fluid, but only if you spend four years in the part of some scare more. Yeah, <laughs> no, by the way, Knapp is four years old this August. It's crazy, right? Really? The last thing to say about Golden Freddy is proving that he gets possessed here, at the first Freddy Fazbear Pizza location rather than in FNAF 4 like most of us have assumed in the past. You see, in Ultimate Custom Night, you get an item called a Death Coin. Yeah. You can eliminate one animatronic from the game, but if you use it on Golden Freddy, you don't eliminate him from the game, you just get jump scared by Fredbear, and then yeah. hear some strange sounds. Oh yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs>
1981. The first Freddy Fazbear location has to close so it can reopen sometime before 1987. However, it has to remain open at least until 1983 when the FNAF 4 might happen. The event that prompts Phone Guy to call back to the FNAF 1 location informing them that the Springlock suits are being retired. Right. Welcome to your new career as a performer slash entertainer for Freddy Fazbear Pizza. Right now we have two specially designed suits that double as both animatronic and suit. After learning of an unfortunate incident at the sister location involving multiple and simultaneous spring lock failures, the company has deemed the suit temporarily unfit for employees. This is important because Bone Guy later makes a point of saying that the spring body suit is still being moved. Management has also been made aware that the spring body animatronic has been noticeably moved. Which implies that Afton is still using it to kill kids, aka the missing children's incident is still going on even after the bite of 1983. Wow. That would all be fine except for point number two, according to Ant Unit and Sister Location, Circus Baby's Pizza World is opened after Freddy Fazbear's is closed. Due to the massive success and even more so the unfortunate closing of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, it was clear that the stage was set, no pun intended, for another contender in children's entertainment. Again, this would be a problem if it wasn't for the empty girl's bedroom that we see in FNAF 4. As we established in a previous episode using the FNAF survival logbook, the crying child is Michael Afton, yeah. which would make this his sister's room, Elizabeth Afton, the girl who gets herself clawed and goes on possessed oh. on the opening day of Baby's Pizzeria. That's why she's missing and why her room is empty. But that can't happen if Freddy's is still open. And Freddy's can't be closed until the bite of 83 causes the spring locks to be retired so that phone guy can make his call. You see the problem there? Do you understand why creating a timeline of all this stuff is so darn complicated? Oh. Anyway, to move forward, we have to apply rule number one that I talked about earlier and throw out some of the phone guy information in order for the events to work. Freddy Fazbear's first location closes in the aftermath of the missing children's incident. With no pizzeria to serve as his murder den, Afton tries to launch a new restaurant, Circus Baby's Pizza World. It's important to note that this is an actual restaurant and not the underground rental service you see in Sister Location. Oh! We'll get to that one much later. Based on the name, we can be confident that this place has a clown aesthetic, which makes it likely that all the animatronics who don't fit into the Freddy Fazbear series of restaurants were made specifically for this place. The Mini Rita's, the Luke Boy, JJ, Dee Dee, and of course, the star attraction, Baby. Notice how they all even look alike. However, on day one of the restaurant oh. opening, Elizabeth, Afton's daughter, finds herself alone herself flawed. We know that it's closed on day one, both from baby's story and sister location. Did you know that I was on stage once? It wasn't for very long. Only one day. And from this hidden news story about a supposed gas leak posted on Scott's website in the lead up to the release of the game. This in turn explains a lot of the weirdness going on in FNAF 4. Why Elizabeth's room is empty. Why Michael Afton has nightmares of animatronics with stomach mouths. And why William locks Michael in his room and has oh. surveillance cameras following him around. He doesn't want what happened to his daughter to also happen to his youngest son. You see why it's so important for Circus Baby's Pizza World to happen before the events of FNAF 4? The Lord I'm actually getting three. scared by this. Fit in place if it does. Anyway, in the aftermath of the trend, good he buries Baby and most of the other humanoid characters underground in the facility that will eventually explore its sister location. The rest oh. move on to the new and improved Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, which is set to reopen. But first, running parallel to all of this, and I mean all of it, is Fred Bear's Family Diner. Not the sister location we visited the game Sister Location, but the only sister location actually called a sister location by phone guy during his FNAF 3 calls about spring locks. An unfortunate incident at the sister location. We know for a fact that Fred Bear's Family Diner is the FNAF 4 location based on this purple hat teaser that came out with the release of the game. Write the image, look down at the bottom right hand corner, and fill in the blanks and you get yourself property oh. of Fred Bear's Family Diner. We also know that it should fit here in the timeline because of one small detail that Scott made note of with the release of FNAF 4's Halloween edition. While Nightmare Puppet and Nightmare Mangled weren't canon, he made it clear that Nightmare Balloon Boy was. Now, if I'm right about Circus Baby's Pizza really? the red cheeked design of its characters, then the crying child would have come across Balloon Boy. He existed at this point in the timeline. Oh. Because both the puppet and Mangle don't exist until the FNAF 2 location, neither of them would be appearing in his nightmares. Therefore, not canon. And therefore, the timeline continues to make sense. So at this point, oh. you know how the story goes. William is working there as what appears to be a suit technician. Michael Afton, a.k.a. the crying child, has witnessed his friends and maybe even his sister get killed. I mean, he's even locked in the supply closet with what appears to be the body of Golden Freddy. Thank you, top priority, and break that pizza. 
why the class citizens are being retired to an appropriate location oh. being looked at by our technician. At the end of the week, at his birthday party, he gets shoved into Fred Bear's mouth by his brother and crunch. He dead, son. The spirits of his dead friends, all five of them, remind them that they're still here for him, and the whole incident goes down in history as the bite of 83, based on both the TV Easter egg in Net 4 and the code in Sister Location Secret Room. Oh. oh. And again, it's here that we hit another little wrinkle. You see, in the FNAF survival logbook, it asks Michael whether his favorite ride was the carousel, a feature that was only present in the FNAF 2 restaurant. This also coincides with my hypothesis earlier about the Midnight Motorist minigame and Junior's being another name for Freddy's version 2. It would make sense that that place that he's going to is indeed him running out to the new Freddy Fazbear's location. But we know Michael has been in 1983 and that the FNAF 2 oh. location is open in 1987 based oh. on the paychecks you see in the game. Oh. Literally, though, there's an elegant solution this time. The FNAF 2 location is just open earlier than we thought. Remember, Fred Bear's Family Diner being open doesn't preclude a new Freddy's location from also being open at the same time. Oh. The new and improved Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria is just open earlier than we all thought, at oh. least as early as 1983, and continuing through 1987. Oh! Yep. To scare Michael away from the restaurant. That's what he means by he'll be sorry when he gets back. Oh! He's intentionally locking him in his room, giving him nightmares. That's why Michael is so scared by the time we see him in Nam 4. Additionally, Ultimate Custom Night proves that the nightmare animatronics are just that. Nightmares. Illusions. This time, there is more than an illusion to fear. I am given flesh to be your tormentor. Both these lines indicate that before, they were just they had no flesh, but now, in the latest game, they are real. So contrary to popular belief, these things were never real animatronics, just a glorified way for William to keep his son away from his murder locations. Except, obviously, it didn't work. Despite his best, well, maybe not his best, but definitely his most stalkerish efforts, Michael gets crunched and dies. A fact that becomes very problematic for the timeline, considering that Michael Aston clearly survives till the end of the game. We see him in sister location. We watch him get scooped. We hear about him burning in FNAF 6. How is all of that possible if he's already dead? Surprisingly, there is a way to solve it, and I have the evidence to prove it, but sadly it'll have to wait until next time. Really? You said it was the full story. Script, which there's no way that we can do all in one week. So in the words of Dee Dee, how unfortunate, how unfortunate. Wow. This is a thing I hate to do, but the rest has to go in a part two. Anyway, don't worry, we'll get it out as fast wow. as possible. It's already written this up for editing purposes. In the meantime, though, make sure you jump scare that subscribe button to, well, who knows what it does at this point, but it makes me feel good about the effort I put into this video, which is really nice, so make me feel good. It also improves the likelihood that you're going to see the conclusion of this episode, which is even better. And in the meantime, if you missed my last NAF theory as well, yeah, I already saw it. So one of these guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Leave a like on the video, subscribe if you want to my channel, and yeah, guys, I'll see you in the next one. Bye! No.